For the recording, as mentioned, I'm Brent Antrim, one of the reference librarians here at Santa Monica College. And today's worksheet, worksheet, I do that all the time. Today's workshop is communication research. As we go along, please use chat to ask your questions. And I will have pauses throughout the presentation where I will check chat, I'll stop sharing, I'll check chat and see if there are any questions or comments. And during those time periods, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. So put them in chat and I'll get to them. So starting off, when we think about communications research as a thing, we have to step back just a little bit more broadly and look at communication studies. And you might be thinking to yourself, why is a librarian talking to me about communication studies? Well, it's true. I do have a master's degree in library and information science, but I also have a master's degree in communication critical studies. And this is my passion area. This is the thing that I enjoy and read things on semiotics and on cultural theory for fun. So yeah, I'm a geek. And I'm a geek specifically for communication studies. So talking about it a little bit, what is communication studies? Um, it's a very, very broad category of studies. It includes everything from um, what we think of when we think of comm studies like um, electronic media, social media platforms, journalism. It also includes intercultural and multilinguistic communication. It includes politics and public administration, speech writing. It includes speech, rhetoric, and performing arts. It includes business, like business administration, the communication between components of an industry or within a corporation. And it includes marketing, advertising, and public relations. So it is incredibly broad. Communication studies, I believe, is one of the most useful majors that a student can have because from that foundational base, you can go any number of ways with it, depending on your own particular interests. And you don't necessarily have to have a master's degree to do it. Here are a list of some of the careers that you can get with a bachelor's degree on an entry level with a bachelor's degree in communication studies. You could be a journalist. I'm not gonna read all of them, but I'm gonna poke through a few of them. Um, you can work in marketing. You can be a technical writer and a technical writer is somebody that, for example, um, you buy that new iPhone and it comes with a little how to. That's what a technical writer does. You get a new kind of software and you have to look at the FAQ to figure out how to use it. That's what a technical writer does. And that goes on not just for the public, but for specialists in different industries. You could be a customer communication specialist um, and that kind of uh, communication is <laughs> fascinating because you're trying to translate corporate language into customer understandable hearing um, and, and work that um, helps the corporation, but also helps the customer. Um, you could become a media specialist, and this might be in traditional, um, like streaming has become relatively traditional, um, to emerging media, like what do you do when you're planning a campaign on TikTok? You could work in the entertainment industry as a screenwriter or a director. Um, you could be a coordinator of things like social media and communications efforts, um, become a communications coordinator in general for a corporation or for a nonprofit. So the VISTA is wide open for communication studies. And this is just with a bachelor's degree. These are entry level positions. One of the things that I recommend for all students and all majors, no matter what they are, um, is for that student to check out professional organizations that work in that discipline. Whether you're planning to be a nurse and you wanna look at a professional organization for nursing, or you're planning to be a fashion designer and you wanna look at a professional organization that will help you with your networking, the same thing happens with communication. And I start with my favorite one, the Popular Culture Association, American Culture Association, those are two journals that are actually published by one group. And I've been a member of this association for close to 15 years now. Um, there are many journalism associations. If you're interested in becoming um, a news investigative reporter, for example, 
There's an association specifically for business communicators. Um, there's an international communication association. So talking communication between groups from different countries. Um, and there's a national communication association specifically for the United States. There's a PR society. There's a social media association. And the nice thing about this association is, as you saw in the previous slide, the communication field is huge and wide open. And that can be a little frustrating sometimes when you're trying to figure out what you would like to do because there are almost too many choices. So one of the things that I recommend as a student is that you take a look at these professional organizations, make a note of them, take a snap of your screen, whatever it might be, and check them out. Because when you go to these associations, they offer a number of things. They offer networking opportunities. They introduce you to people who are currently working in the field who are happy to talk to students about what they do. They have conferences where they discuss what's going on in their discipline right now. And um, they help people who are trying to figure out if this is what, really what they'd like to do. Because if you get a student membership, they also have student memberships that cost usually less than half, sometimes as, as low as like 20% of what it would be for a professional to be a member of these organizations. And a student membership gives you access to conference papers and conferences and networking and people and blogs and all sorts of things, programs that you would not have the option to see or participate in or read if you are not a member of that association. And if you do this as a student, you can determine, wow, you know, I, I really kind of thought I was into public relations, but now that I see what they actually do, Maybe not. And you can decide that before you've taken four years worth of classes and gotten your degree and you have found your first job and realized you really don't like it. Or you could find out maybe I went into the social media association and found out about jobs I never even knew existed out there. And that's really what I want to do. So professional organizations are a way to not only find out more about a field, but to help you clarify for yourself what you would like to do first for your degree and then for your career. So I highly recommend them. Please do explore these. I'm not going to go out to them at this time. Um, if you have questions about it and you'd like me to, I will do so. Um, but right now we're going to head into some resources that are available to you via, San via Santa Monica College um, through the Career Center. And I don't know if you've checked out the Career Center or not yet, but I recommend it. One of the things that the Career Center gives you is it gives you options to um, explore possible careers and the majors that go with those careers. Um, if you have a career in mind, or if you just have an area of interest and you're not really sure what careers that would apply to, it allows you to explore careers through your areas of interest. It also has workshops. It also has websites that you can view that can help you with this and many more things. So I'm just going to show you one of these. Okay. Now, my question for you, are you seeing the page that says career and major exploration? Mm -hmm. No, we yes. saw the PowerPoint, I think. Are you still seeing the PowerPoint, Victoria? Yes. yes. Okay, then I'm going to stop share it. See if they don't play well together, and then I'm going to reshare again, and I'm going to show you the website. Now, are you seeing the one that says career and major exploration? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so this is via the Career Services Center, the Career Center, and one of the nice things about this is. It breaks you down, not just breaks you down, yeah, it breaks it down um, to interest areas, career guides, things that will help you with resumes and cover letters and how to present yourself for an interview, um, workshops, and also, and I really like this, um, career websites. Did you follow me on that one? Does it say career and major resource websites? Yep. Yes. Because sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And these are really particularly impressive websites that can help you figure out how the work you're doing right now can be put into practical application for a career later. 
because I think the number one problem often that students have when they're doing so much work, especially in their first two years, is they think, why, do, why am I doing this? How am I ever going to use this? How does this apply to what I'm doing? And we can tell you as educators, this is laying a foundation, helping you learn to be logical, helping you learn to think, et cetera. But that's a nebulous, really hard to pin down connection. This helps you pin down your courses that you're taking so you feel like you're building toward a goal and that goal is a career. And one of the ones that I recommend is ONET. And one of the reasons why I like ONET is because it talks about individual jobs. It's uh, what we know of in print as the Occupational Outlook Handbook. And it narrows down specific jobs, tells you for that job what kind of education you have to have, um, what sort of skills you would be expected to use in this job, um, about how much you might make in your first year, even whether this job area is growing or shrinking. So whether in five years you'll have a job um, or not. So those are some very useful websites that I think um, might come in handy for you later. So I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. Share my screen. Are we back to the PowerPoint? Yes, we're back. Excellent. <laughs> I do checks a lot because I have done workshops and I'm just merrily blithering along. And then like five minutes later, a student said, we have no idea what you're talking about because that's not what's on the screen. <laughs> so now I check a lot. <clears throat> so we're in the, um, that's sort of an overview of the communication studies field some things you can do with a degree in that field and some places where you can go to take a look at some of those careers that you can use in that field. So from this part on, um, this workshop focuses down more on what you're doing right now. So the example that I'm gonna start with is I'm gonna walk you through how you would do research if you were doing um, particular types of topics for particular areas within communication studies. So like um, sociology, for example, you can have a wide variety of topics in communication studies. The topics under comm studies include any social issue that involves humans communicating or the relationship between humans and technology that mediates that interaction. So social media, for example, Zoom. Zoom is a mediator between humans. Um, and you take those issues and then you look at them through the lens of some sort of critical communication analysis, media theory, cultural theory, hegemony, et cetera. If you're not in a comm studies class, you can take a broader view and look at say a topic for a speech or a presentation or a topic that you're creating some sort of media product to give to an audience via a particular media stream, whether that's a podcast, whether it is a streaming video, whether it's a PSA, whatever it might be. So what are you required to do? It depends on your project. If you were in a speech class here in Tom Studies 11 and you need to do an informative speech, first off with any research project, you determine a topic that will interest you, but also will interest your audience, that will have value to your audience, because capturing and keeping their attention is part of your speech. Get instructor approval for that topic, and then begin your research, and we'll fall, we'll fall pretty deeply into that. Once you've gotten your sources, and you've read through them, and you've assimilated them, and figured out how you want to focus your topic, then you write it out, you practice it, determine what works, what doesn't work. You refine it and revise it and present it. Now, if your topic is for an essay, textual as opposed to verbal, again, you determine a topic of interest to you within the instructions that your instructor gives you, within those parameters or those particular requirements, because you don't have an audience that you need to worry about except your teacher. So think of your teacher as your audience. If they get 450 papers on the same, you know, abortion, by paper number four, they're going to be bored out of their mind. 
So if you find topics that interest you because you want to be interested to do the research that you think are a little bit different than what your colleagues are doing in class, that will help actually when the teacher goes to grade them. Then you start to explore your topic generally, broadly, sort of find out what's out there. You don't want to fixate on a topic that is so narrow that you can't find anything on it. So you, you start big and then you narrow it down based on what you find until you can fulfill the requirements of whatever your essay assignment is. Then you take that research, you write it out, yet edit it. I'm having a small technical difficulty. And you cite it to give credit to the people whose work you used. And we actually have a couple of workshops on the SMC Library YouTube channel that will uh, help with citation and also talk about plagiarism because there are a lot of questions that come up about that. The third type of project you could have under Com Studies is a media project of some sort. Once again, and you'll notice some themes here, you determine a topic of interest to you because if you're bored creating it, anyone watching it will also be bored. It has to interest your audience, like the speech, and be within the parameters given to you by your instructor, like the essay, and also with the limitations that are unique to that medium. You can talk more in a podcast, you need to show more in a vid stream, for example. Research it, plan it out with your team, and there's usually a team involved in this. Then you write it, you practice it, you run it, you produce it, you edit it, you do post prod, you finish it, and you present it. And this is also why you need a team, because that's a heck of a lot of work for one person to do. And having done small films back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, <laughs> yeah, it was 30 years ago, but I made a few. And that's a heck of a lot of work for one person to do from writing to editing. So today's example, we're going to take the first one and we're going to look at an informative speech. And um, we're going to pretend that I'm a student in a Com Studies 11 class. And you're going to follow me along on my research journey. So the first step is to think critically about your topic. And I'm going to attempt to show you a YouTube. So let me make sure. Let me stop the share because again, I don't trust it. And come on, you can do it. Grammarly does more than catch errors. With Grammarly, you can find really good, no, perfect words. That make your writing sharp, or explicit, or excellent, or distinctive. As a matter of fact, for what it's worth, we're waiting through the uh, yeah. advertisement. We can get rid of that. And this. small and unimportant, but others have a larger impact on our lives. For example, which politician should I vote for? Should I try the latest diet craze? Or will email make me a millionaire? We're bombarded with so many decisions that it's impossible to make a perfect choice every time. But there are many ways to improve our chances, and one particularly effective technique is critical thinking. This is a way of approaching a question that allows us to carefully deconstruct a situation, reveal its hidden issues, such as bias and manipulation, and make the best decision. If the critical part sounds negative, that's because, in a way, it is. Rather than choosing an answer because it feels right, a person who uses critical thinking subjects all available options to scrutiny and skepticism. Using the tools at their disposal, they'll eliminate everything but the most useful and reliable information. There are many different ways of approaching critical thinking, but 
here's one five-step process that may help you solve any number of problems. One, formulate your question. In other words, know what you're looking for. This isn't always as straightforward as it sounds. For example, if you're deciding whether to try out the newest diet craze, your reasons for doing so may be obscured by other factors, like claims that you'll see results in just two weeks. But if you approach the situation with a clear view of what you're actually trying to accomplish by dieting, whether that's weight loss, better nutrition, or having more energy, that'll equip you to sift through this information critically, find what you're looking for, and decide whether the new fad really suits your needs. Two, gather your information. There's lots of it out there, so having a clear idea of your question will help you determine what's relevant. If you're trying to decide on a diet to improve your nutrition, you may ask an expert for their advice or seek other people's testimonies. Information gathering helps you weigh different options, moving you closer to a decision that meets your goal. Three, apply the information, something you do by asking critical questions. Facing a decision, ask yourself, what concepts are at work? What assumptions exist? Is my interpretation of the information logically sound? For example, in an email that promises you millions, you should consider, what is shaping my approach to this situation? Do I assume the sender is telling the truth? Based on the evidence, is it logical to assume I'll win any money? Four, consider the implications. Imagine it's election time and you've selected a political candidate based on their promise to make it cheaper for drivers to fill up on gas. At first glance, that seems great, but what about the long-term environmental effects? If gasoline use is less restricted by cost, this could also cause a huge surge in air pollution, an unintended consequence that's important to think about. Five, explore other points of view. Ask yourself, why so many people are drawn to the policies of the opposing political candidate. Even if you disagree with everything that candidate says, exploring the full spectrum of viewpoints might explain why some policies that don't seem valid to you appeal to others. This will allow you to explore alternatives, evaluate your own choices, and ultimately help you make more informed decisions. This five-step process is just one tool and it certainly won't eradicate difficult decisions from our lives, but it can help us increase the number of positive choices we make. Critical thinking can give us the tools to sift through a sea of information and find what we're looking for. And if enough of us use it, it has the power to make the world a more reasonable place. Okay, so it's a little bit of bouncing back and forth, but here we go back to our PowerPoint. Hmm. Is everyone seeing the PowerPoint again? Yeah. Yes. Great. So doing research is step two, and that's what we're going to focus on right now, gathering your sources. So where do you find your information? Um, well, you start off by looking for the big picture, the background, the context, why your topic is important, why anyone would care, why it would catch your audience's attention. And you do that in the catalog. Um, and the catalog is just a database of all of our books that we own. And because we're remote right now, it's also a catalog of all of, or most of our electronic resources as well. The databases are specific types of information repositories. And by that, I mean, um, they might be uh, all about scholarly journals or all about business or all about the government or all about psychology. The web, as you know, has everything on it except it really doesn't. Um, about, the percentages vary depending on the research that you study, but about half of what's out on the web you can't actually access because it either requires special skills or it requires uh, being a member of a particular organization and getting some sort of um, accessibility via that organization. So for example, our databases can only be used by SMC 
um, faculty, students, and staff because you have to log in as an SMC person in order to access those databases. So they're not free and open on the web. And a lot more out there than you might think is actually cut off that way. But the one thing you do need to do for anything that you come across on the web is you have to evaluate who is responsible for the information that you're reading. What are they actually saying? Not the spin around it, but what they're actually getting to the meat of what they're saying. And why are they putting it out there? What is their motivation? And we have a fantastic, I think, workshop on um, fake news, also available on our SMC Library YouTube channel. Um, it's linked from the library homepage. Um, and I highly recommend, in fact, in the library one class that I teach, I assign it. Um, I highly recommend that you take a look at it when you get the chance. Some of the ways that you can evaluate the information that you're looking at and determine um, who it's from is to determine, is this person who's presenting this information an expert? Or are they a celebrity? And celebrities are tough. We trust celebrities because we like them. We're used to their faces, we're used to the voices. And subconsciously, we give more weight to their words than they deserve, <laughs> quite honestly. We also need to determine, is it an advertisement? If it is, of course, it's gonna be skewed to sell you whatever that is. Or is it a political message? Does it come from a politician? Politicians, like everyone, have agendas, but their agendas are a little bit stronger than regular people, I think, because they're trying to sell a particular platform. And if you have a politician who is also a medical doctor, when they are speaking as a politician, they may say things that they would not say as a medical doctor. Um, because they're trying to put forward a particular political agenda. So when you look at a politician, if you think, well, they're a brain surgeon, they know what they're talking about. They're not talking to you as a brain surgeon right now. They're talking to you as a politician following a party line. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're hearing it. Also make sure that you um, look for research and not anecdotes. Research is something that can be proven because it's tested over and over and over and over again. Anecdotes, um, th so therefore it's generalizable. That information can be generalized to whatever was being studied. Anecdotes are individual. They apply to that person, maybe their family or some of their friends that this happened to, but you don't necessarily know that that same experience would happen to anyone else under those same circumstances. So um, anecdotes hook us because they are human stories and we are drawn to human stories but research is what you want to rely on um, when you're trying to prove facts. I'm having a few technical issues here. And again, here are the library workshops, um, both live ones. We have one live one each semester and then we archive that live one um, on our workshop page. Now I'm going to go through a couple of relatively quick searches with you. Um, I don't see anything coming up in chat. So I'm going to go on because I don't see any questions. Um, for any database that you use at SMC, you have to log on with your Canvas login because that's that wall you have to get through in order to use them. And I'm going to show you how to limit your search so that you get books. Um, we have 24 seven library research assistance called Ask a Librarian. So you can talk to a librarian at any time if you get stuck. And um, when you're looking at your results, books in print have a call number. It's kind of like an address for a book. You're probably familiar with this. If it has a call number, it's in print. And you can't get it right now because the library is closed. So make sure that you find ebooks when you go searching. And here is the workflow for that. So I'm going to lay it out for you, um, and then we're going to do it. So um, you just go to the library homepage, you click on databases. There are several databases that are broken out by topic. You find the books. We have several collections of eBooks. You pick one of them. Um, today, I'm going to use the topic media and activism, social media specifically and activism. And I'm gonna show you how to limit that and then find and look at a title and read and open the book, okay? So. Let me stop chat for just a sec.
or stop share for just a chat on the brain. Okay. So. Okay. So from the school homepage, in order to get to the library, you want to click on menu and then find the little plus sign next to student support and scroll down to library, which is between counseling and tutoring. And once you're there, no pearl, I don't need help. If you need help from a librarian, this little ask us pops out and you can chat directly with a librarian. If you're not sure where to start, this is a great starting place. But today we are going to go take a look at the books. So I'm gonna head into the databases and the databases, as you can see, are broken into disciplines. All databases is a list of everything we subscribe to with a short description of what's in each database. So you can tell before you go in whether it's going to be on topic for you or not. Ebooks, that's where we're going. So you have a couple of different places you can start. If you're looking for more technology, you can go into Safari. If you're looking for more literature, you can go into Cambridge. I'm just sort of looking really broadly, so I'm going to go into the EBSCO ebook collection, which is our largest collection of ebooks. If you have not logged in, it will pop up a login for you, and until you close your browser, that login should be good. Okay. Then we wait for the server to catch up. Okay, now if you've done searching in databases before, this whole setup, this interface should look relatively familiar but it doesn't have nearly as much in it and it's browsable by category. So you can actually come in here, I'm looking for a biography of Malcolm X and then you can go there and go specifically there. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I'm looking for social media and activism. You can select specific areas to look for this, but I'm just gonna go broad and say, give, give me everything you've got database. And it says, okay, I have four. <laughs> so obviously there's not a whole lot on the eBooks, but quite often your teacher just wants you to find one. So it's okay. So if I find one that looks interesting, ooh, this looks kind of interesting. Alternative and activist media. And your immediate impression is it's 15 years old. And my reaction to that is remember what the book is for. The book is not for what's happening right now. The book is for background, context, the big picture, where this came from. So this gives you the history of your topic, and then you go into the articles to find the current information. So I can go into this book. It will allow me to save it, cite it, email parts of it. So if I need to do an MLA citation or an APA citation, for example, it will give me the beginning of one, and then I can fix that and put it in my work cited for my speech based on how my teacher wants me to do that. It tells me a little bit about it. It shows me where my search terms showed up on it. And then it gives me the table of contents. So if I wanna go into here, I can open up the book just like I would with a print book at any part depending on what I'm interested in. And once I'm there, maybe I really like this, I can email pages to myself. The publisher limits how many pages I can limit. That's beyond our control. The publisher will only allow me to save print or email 100 pages. So I have the option of sending just the current page, this page and the next two pages, or this entire chapter, which happens to be 12 pages. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. So I'm going to just do the current page. I'm going to email it to myself. I'm going to give it some kind of a subject just so I know what it is. Do not send it in plain text format and then send it off. Okay. And my screen is not moving. So I can't show you what that looks like. So helpful. One moment while I change my view. email PDF. My eyes are not so good, so I have my uh, view expanded. And then once you have sent it off, 
give it a few minutes and it'll show up in your email. And then you can go back to your results after you've explored this book and see if there's another book that would also work. Okay. So that's how you use the eBooks. I'm going to stop my share for a second. Does anybody have any questions? No, I don't see anything in chat. Okay, so sharing back. After you've got your books, then you find your periodicals. And periodicals are literally anything that's published periodically. Newspaper, magazine, journal, anything like that. They come in two batches. They can either be popular or they can be academic. And that refers to both the people who write them and the people they're aimed at. So popular things, newspapers and magazines, are about current events written by reporters who may not be experts in that topic, intended for everyone to read, using colloquial or everyday language. And the reading level is usually a little below adult. It's usually around fifth to seventh grade. And the reason for that is so that they can get their widest possible audience. Um, and have those people be able to understand what they're reading. Then you have academic periodicals, which are journals, dissertations, theses, um, and they are different in literally every way. <laughs> they are scholarly. They are reviewed by others, experts in the discipline before they're published. They are written by researchers for researchers, so they have a very specific aimed audience. Readers are expected to understand professional and graduate level language, to understand enough about the discipline to not need a whole lot of explanation. Um, so they know at least the basics of the topic and there's, there's not a whole lot of quarter given. <laughs> so like you either get it or you don't. And that's why academic journals can be difficult to read when you're not an expert in that discipline. Um, but the more you read them, the more sense they make because the more you know about the topic, the easier it is to understand them. And one of these is not better than the other. Popular um, periodicals have a specific purpose that academic periodicals do not work for. And academic periodicals have a specific purpose that popular periodicals do not work for. So you need both in your research. So um, when you go looking, in your databases, you want to make some limits to what you find or you're going to be overloaded with information. You want to know, am I looking for news? Am I looking for academic information? Am I looking for books? And then tell the database that. Um, you don't want to read everything as you come to it because you get really tired really fast. And then you start missing details and you miss good stuff and you settle for not so good stuff. So most academic journals have an abstract, which is a summary written by the author of the article. And that one or two paragraphs can tell you very quickly if you think this article can be useful to you or not. And if it is, mail it to yourself. If it's not, skip it, right? Different types of periodicals have different like good for dates or shelf dates. Um, for journal articles, it takes some time to go through that peer review process to get the research solid and then publish it. So usually the last five to 10 years and for medical or law or technology um, type topics, probably the last five years. For newspapers, because it changes all the time, you wanna get the most current news because that story that was um, published two months ago, maybe something has happened to update it. And if you rely on the old story, you'll miss that new news. So I seldom go back beyond three to six months on newspapers. And for magazines, again, they're current, so you want to look for the more current one, but they don't publish as often. They publish like once a month instead of daily. So maybe the last one to two years for those guys. When you're searching specifically for a journal, and that's what we're going to be doing for this topic, um, just like with the catalog, you go to the library homepage, you go to the databases button, only instead of ebooks, you click on all databases, and then you pick a database based on what your search is, okay? Um, today, again, we're going to use uh, social media and activism. Um, we're going to limit it so we don't get journals from 1900. We get journals from like 2016 to now. And then you just click on that article, take a look at it, decide if you want to cite it and send it to yourself. And if you get stuck in your search, the Ask a Librarian chat window is actually embedded in the database. So you can ask questions without losing your search. Okay. 
So here's what that looks like. Is everybody back with me at the um, site where we just were? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to show you a little shortcut. If you just do smc.edu and then slash library, that's the tiny URL to get to the library. As you notice, that's not what shows up when you're actually here, but that will work for you. Okay. Nope, we're fine. You head into the databases. You go into all databases right above eBooks. And I want to show you something before we actually do that search. You'll notice when you go into databases that we have things like business, health, literature, social sciences. These are not the full listing of databases. These are only those databases that are specifically about your topic or that have significant content on your topic. And it's prioritized. So the databases that have the most about your topic will be at the top. And then those more general databases that also include some stuff on your topic will be at the bottom. But there it's, much, it's a much shorter list. So if you're doing um, <coughs> excuse me, an essay for business, for example, you can just go straight to business resources or you're in English too. You can just go straight to literature. And then you don't have to go through this you know, 45 database long list to determine what it is that you want to use. So, <coughs> pardon me. Um, for this specific database search, I'm going to go into communication and mass media complete. It is a discipline specific database. So um, it has a lot of journals that are just about media, social media, and how it's used. So when I head into there, because I've already logged in, it won't ask me to do it again. Before I even do my search, I'm going to apply some limiters. The first limiter I'm going to make sure is that it says it's full text. Okay. The next thing is I'm going to say, just give me the last five years. 2021 has just begun, so going back to 2016. Okay. Now I'm going to say I'm looking for social media and I'm looking for activism. Now we got four books. When we do this search in this database, we get 161 articles. This is current, whether the books were historical, but we still get sort of a variety of things. If it's an academic journal, it'll tell you. A conference paper is a journal article before it has completed the peer review process. So you might actually come up with a journal, academic journal article and a conference paper with the exact same title and the exact same research team. If that happens, use the academic journal, not the conference paper, because the academic journal is the completed reviewed version. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing a few of those. So over here, I can add more limiters. And I might say here, I want to have just scholarly journal articles. And that takes it down another 30 or so. So if I see something that I like, so hmm, this looks kind of interesting. Beyond Slacktivism. <laughs> this is from the International Journal of Strategic Communication and from August of 2019. It's 15 pages long and it looks kind of interesting to me. So I can click on the title and when it opens it, it'll give me all of the information that I need for my citation and once again, the option to get help with your citation. It'll give you subject terms. And what's really cool here is your subject terms, when you click on them, are live links. And they will research the entire database specifically for only articles that have that subject term attached to them. Here is the abstract that tells me what it's about. Okay, This tells me this is not a research article in that they didn't go out and do research with people. This instead is sort of an explanation article. Okay. Here's what we should do in order to find out more of these things. The article itself is available both in HTML typed in and the PDF of the full text. I always recommend getting the PDF when you email it to yourself because if there's any graphs or images or graphics in it, you'll need the PDF to get those. If I email it, 
The email is the same way um, that you would for book with one major exception. It does not matter how long your article is when you email it to yourself, you will get the entire article. Okay. You can also add it to your Google Drive. You can save it and cite it and print it and add it to a folder. So these are all options that you have for any database search that you do. I'm going to go back to my results now by clicking result list. And if you get stuck in your search over here on the right is the chat with a librarian. So you don't even have to lose your search. You can be right in the middle of your search and not even have to go to another tab. Just say, I have no idea why I'm getting Uganda and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. I am looking for the United States and the Black Lives Matter movement. And you can go into the chat with a librarian and say that, and the librarian can say, well, try these search terms and see if that works. Okay. So I'm going to stop my share. I don't see any chat questions, so yay. And I'm going to share again, going back to my PowerPoint. And the last thing that is not on a slide, because I want people to actually listen to this, is if you are um, using this workshop for extra credit, your extra credit word, your code word is evaluate. I'm going to put that in chat. My chat just disappeared. Well, that's weird. So when you go back into your classes and you talk to your teachers, use the code word evaluate and my last name. Thank you. It is not doing what I want it to do. Yep. Okay. Ah, Zoom. I would say I love you, but that would be a lie. Okay, so for your extra credit, code word evaluate. My name is Bryn Antrim, and the title of the workshop is Library Workshop Communication Research. So does anybody have any questions about anything that we have covered today? 